Wilkerson. I love you, Dave. Thank you. Be seated, please. Well, one thing we have to say before we say anything else is that God is here. I said God has been here, and he's here at this moment also. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that blonde lady sitting here in the front seat. Honey, there are a lot of new people, some in the balcony. Just stand up and wave at the people so they can remember you in prayer. I'm a little nervous. I haven't preached in months. <laughs> but we know the Holy Spirit is here. I want to talk to young pastors and young Christian workers, whoever you may be here now. And I have on many occasions young pastors say, could, could I have 15 minutes with you if just, just to find out how God used you, and uh, they've read the book or seen the movie or <clears throat> heard a message and touched them, and of course, couldn't do it. It's impossible. But I'd like to take that 15 minutes with you right now. I'm 79 years old, been preaching for 58 years, and I've seen a lot of things endured a lot of things, but I, I just want to speak to you. I have no notes. I have no uh, prepared sermon, but I have a heart, I think, that's ready to share a few things with you that when you leave here, you find out that you're not just talking about the church. We're talking about you and your heart. Uh, yes, yesterday, when they were praying, we were praying for one another, a uh, young pastor and his wife asked for prayer and uh, I said could you sum up in one word what you're going through and they said discouragement they weren't depressed but they were discouraged I want to talk to you about what happened to me when I got my heart so stirred I, now I've already prayed for blessing on this so don't think I haven't prayed about the message. I want to get right into what I feel the Lord would have me share with you. I pastored a little church in Pennsylvania, a town of about a thousand people. I pastored a little church of about a hundred people. They were good people. They were farmers. They were miners. And I loved them, and I pastored there for five years. But on the fifth year, especially, and it had been growing on me for quite a while, I, I, I would see the same faces. No one was being saved. And f I had we had a nice little cottage next to the church and enough to live on. And I, I did what most of us do. I had my devotional time. And I read my Bible, especially to get sermons, and occasionally would just read for the sake of trying to get closer to the Lord's heart. Not an educated man. I had one year of Bible school. But my father, I, can't, I came from a line of pastors, uh, preachers. I think I'm the eighth generation all the way back to the Civil War, where one of my great Grandparents died in the Civil War and came from alignment preachers, and my father taught me to pray, 
to seek the face of God. He said, David, there's only 24 hours in a day. That's all Elijah had, and he prayed. You can pray like Elijah, and you can, he said, God always makes a way for a praying man. I was taught to pray in, in teenage years. I remember praying and being so touched by the hand of God. I would, I would lay before, prostrated before the Lord, that I would try to get up, and a hand would just, I couldn't see it, but it would just place me back down. And that feeling was so exhilarating. It's so incredible to have the hand of God just lay you back down. And you start laughing and crying. It's so, it's so incredible, the touch. And I've known the touch of God. I was called when I was eight years old into the ministry. Now, please don't think this is an old man just rambling. God allowed me to come to this place at this time to share my heart. I, I, I got tired, I got weary of being a Pentecostal church and not seeing anything happen, preaching to the same people, four songs, testimony meeting, a sermon, altar call, and never see anybody at the altar. And I came to the conclusion that if this is Pentecost, I don't want it. All these years just in, in, in four walls and not seeing anybody. Of course, we weren't going out to see anybody. We, weren't, we were not out in those restaurants and other places. But I began to seek the face of God. And when you begin to uh, seek the face of God, the devil will bring a conspiracy of interruptions. And I'm telling this now. If you set your heart to seek God, if you set your heart to seek him, the devil's going to put on you a conspiracy of interruptions. You'll receive calls like you've never received before. He will do everything to keep you from the prayer closet. But I'm here. T I'm here this evening. Would you would you pray with me right now, Heavenly Father? You've given me a word. I, I tell you, somebody just bring me a chair Up from the side there, please. I've been going through a physical. Just right here, please. That's fine. I told Pastor Carter once, that there may be a day come when he has to wheel me out in the pulpit in a wheelchair, but I'll still be here. I, I got a burden of prayer, God stirs hearts. When God wants to do something for a generation, for a city or a town, he's going to stir somebody's heart. He's going to find a young man. He's going to find somebody whose heart is being stirred. And if you're going to wait for the Holy Ghost to just stir your heart, sometimes he does that. But if you're going to wait and say, I'll pray and I'll seek God, I'll be a man of prayer, but I have to, the Holy Ghost will have to do that. No, you can go through this book and you can hear it from Elijah, you hear it from the, uh, all the major prophets and the minor prophets, and he set his heart to seek God, or he fixed his heart on God. There was a decision made, and I made the decision I would seek God. There were interruptions, and everything came along to try to keep me from my knees. And I believe you have to find a place alone, a trysting spot with God, where you go there and you know you will meet God there, and that's a special place, and God makes it a hallowed ground. Mine was getting in my car and going up on, on a hillside where my wife could see the car, and I went into the woods, and I said, Lord, I'm going to fix my heart. I'm going to seek you. I, I am not satisfied. I've been to conferences and I would leave with the same discouragement. Nothing was happening. 
And I want to tell you, behind every successful pastor, everyone who has been used in, of God, uh, either in parachurch ministries or in churches themselves, you will always find a praying man. You'll find a praying woman. And I, I got in that car and I went out in the woods and I got my Bible and said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm not looking for a sermon now. I'm looking for your heart. And I stayed there for weeks. And if anyone came to the house, she would point to the car. And because I, I believed then that I had to set aside everything in my life. There had to be something more than what I was experiencing. And I wanted to see Pentecost. I didn't want to have just people talk in tongues and, and, and uh, talk about their Pentecostal experience and give their little testimony, which is fine. And I don't belittle that. But I, 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 I see many, many pastors around the world. And, and I, Greg and I, or Gary and I, I think are in 60 countries in, in the last six years. And that discouragement is all over the world. This, the, the, this concept of being Pentecostal and being endued with power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you see none of that happening. You yearn for it, and you see see it in spots. And uh, you, you come to this place. At least, at least I did. And if I were to sit down and talk to a young pastor and his wife, I I, I, I would. I would bear down on this, the need to set a time and a place and where you say, I'm Lord, whatever it costs, you have to do something in my heart. I had a couple come from England uh, to Times Square Church a number of years ago, middle-aged, a church in London, about 700 people. And His church started dwindling. It was down now to about 500. Took three months off and traveled around the United States visiting revivals, trying to find the key, something to to staunch the uh, the leaving of the people and the diminishing of the the anointing. And they had been to all the all the miracle meetings. They'd been to neg mega churches looking for a key looking for things elements that they can add to attract people they came backstage and he told me he said I, I've been here three months and traveled all over looking for for something that could help us bring revival and I can't understand why people are leaving the church and I hesitated I didn't have a word for him but then the Holy Spirit came upon me and I pointed to the wife. And I said, my dear, I hear the Holy Spirit saying that you were once on fire for God and you once were a praying woman. You were seeking the face of God. And God used you mightily to encourage your husband. And they both began to weep. And he said, Pastor Dave, that's it. This is the first place we have felt the presence of the Lord. And the need, we, we just felt the the need to get home and get back on our knees and seek the face of God. And I remember the anointing that came with that designated hours of prayer where nothing, nothing meant more, nothing was more urgent, nothing was more needful in my life but to get back to prayer. And I remember trying to stand up in front of our people and I break down and weep. And I didn't know what the weeping was. It was the Holy Spirit, of course. But I remember falling on my face and in the front of the people and rolling under the seat and groaning and just crying out to God. You see, when you begin to seek God just to seek his face, you're not just fasting and praying for uh, some one item, some one, some uh, burden which is that's necessary, and I believe in that. 
but there has to come a time where you just say, Lord, I have got to know you. I have got to have the touch of God. I have to have something more than I have. And I had a little prayer room in our little cottage, just a very, about a eight by 10 or so, and I would spread a carpet, remember it was green, and I just said, God, I want to know why you're stirring my heart. I want to know what this is all about. Are you opening a door? What it is I didn't know? And this has been told in the cross and switchblade, but I, I, I just want to share my heart with you on it. And I said, Lord, you have to tell me what's going on because I, 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 I'm broken. I weep before you. And you're opening the word because I took my Bible with me up there in the woods and underlined it and just getting to know God, just getting to draw close to him. I, I wasn't praying for ministry. I wasn't praying for anything, but, but praying for God, make me fruitful, use my life. I, you called me when I was a, just a boy. You know, it, there's more to it than this. This is not Pentecost. At Pentecost, there were thousands saved and, and there was fruit and there was blessing of the Lord and I don't have it. I've been preaching dry sermons. And one day when I was there, magazine, Life magazine was on, the, on, the, uh, on my desk and the Holy Spirit said, pick it up and read it. The picture of the seven boys, and of course that led to my call in New York City. And I, fi I find out that that every time God wants to do something fresh in my life, there's this same stirring. And some of you, young pastors, now there's been a stirring. You you've been to this conference, and you you've been challenged, and you felt a stirring in your own heart. But I, I remember what a great prophet said to me, Leonard Ravenhill, who was a dear friend and he was one of my partners and editor of our magazine, Modern Elijah. And he, I, 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 we were talking about what was happening in my life because he, he lived just a, a mile or so from where we lived. <clears throat> He wrote Revival Terry's and other great books. The great, he was a modern day Elijah. And I was telling him about this and the need, this, this urgency to pray and to fast and seek the face of God. And he said, David, I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna tell you what the real problem is in the church of Jesus Christ. Preachers don't pray. He said it the second time, David, I'm telling you, I, wherever I go and wherever I preach, I preach on this. The preachers don't pray, and the altars are filled, and the confessions come that I haven't prayed. Some say I haven't prayed for a month. Some don't even believe that prayer works anymore because they don't see immediate answers. And I've found that all over the world, that preachers don't pray, the majority. Now, as I said before, every place you will find a thriving church where people are being saved, you're going to find a man. you find more than one, but you'll find a man that's been on his face before God and that he has put that first as his primary objective to lay before God and seek his face. I'm speaking to some of you came to this conference and you are discouraged. You came discouraged. If I asked for a show of hands, there'd be many, many dozens of hands raised. There, there would be wives of husbands who are in the ministry that are facing problems and despair, and yet you, 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 you don't allow God to bring this stirring in your heart. And some of you that are here now were prayer warriors. Some of you older ladies, you were prayer warriors. You, you sought the face of God when there were when there were problems in the church. You you prayed, you prayed and sought the face of God. 
and God answered you. And now some of you, can I say it lovingly, are planted in front of a TV set watching American Idol and you know more about the contestants than you do about the working of the Holy Spirit in the church. I'm asking you now while I'm here and I'm pleading through the Holy Spirit because I know the Holy Spirit is on me. I'm asking the mothers of Zion, uh, where are you on Saturday night before the service? And what are you watching and where is your heart? And what about the coldness? And what about just the little bit of time that you give for praying for, to pray for your husband and pray for the for the church and this and and your family where is the burden of the lord i've prayed all my life all my ministry i've been preaching for 58 years and i don't if i seldom miss a day praying for all my children and having the burden of the lord i was reading this morning i think it's the 11th chapter of of Acts, Paul goes down to Antioch. He'd been to Jerusalem and he said they, they added nothing to me there. But he heard about what was happening down in Antioch. There was a black man, I believe his name was uh, Simon, and there were prophets, and there were teachers, and they, they were having prayer meetings. Saul, Paul, Paul goes to Antioch. And the story is very clear about how the man, how man gets a call of God. The Bible says, and they ministered unto the Lord. They ministered unto the Lord. They were, they were simply giving their time in worship. The New Living Bible said they worshiped. They, 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 I don't know how many days they were there, but it said they ministered to the Lord, first of all. Then it says that they fasted, and they fasted again. And they said, then they laid hands on them, and the Holy Ghost sent them out. They were sent by the Holy Ghost. God blessed me over these years. And I've known the hand of God, but he stirred me again about 25 years ago. I felt that same stirring. I wonder how many of you know what I'm talking about when the Holy Ghost wants to do something and he starts stirring you up. There's, he, 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 he gets into the nest and he pokes and, and there. There, there's some kind of divine dissatisfaction. There's something that is yearning for more, and it's not an ego trip. It's not something that you want to do because you, you have your hands full now. But God stirs the nest, and he, he began to stir my nest again. I was preaching to multitudes, and God was using me. And <clears throat> But I felt... A stirring in my heart and I, I was holding street meetings every, every summer in New York City on the streets because that was my favorite place to preach on the streets and, and I heard the Lord say go back to seeking my face again I had been praying at the time but this time it was a giving of yourself to prayer, just giving yourself to prayer, uh, re, re, retooling your, your schedule so that you make time to seek his face. And this is what the Holy Spirit told me this morning. If you do nothing else, if nothing else is accomplished, when you stand up there for the audience, if nothing else comes out of the meeting but an urgency, a stirring 
to get back to fixing your mind and your heart and true prayer and ministering unto the Lord, just ministering unto the Lord. We get so tied up with getting a sermon, whether it's a series or some fresh word of the Lord, but oftentimes it takes us away from this commitment that I believe has to be made before God can be, God can use a person. And I feel that there are some of you now that are discouraged and you're downhearted because you have you you have done it in a measure. You have prayed and you sought the Lord and you fasted. And you said nothing has happened. Well, what I'm talking about is having it out with the Lord where you say, Lord, I'm not quitting here. I'm not going to stop this until I get an answer. I'm I'm. I'm not going to let you go. I, I, I'm, I, you have something that you're stirring my heart about. There's something that you want me to do, and I'm going to wait until the Holy Spirit says. I know when I went to New York City, first time for gangs and drug addicts, I knew the Holy Ghost sent me because I was with him, because he came upon me. He laid his hand upon me. And I don't think that's unique. I don't think that's that's uh, uh, just common to myself or a few other people been used by God. But I believe that there's some that are being stirred right now. You can't leave this conference. You can't go back to where you were, and you can't settle down and be satisfied or just saying, this is the cards that have been handed to me. This is what what my life is going to be. This is... I'm destined to just be here. Folks, I shudder to think what would happen if I didn't set my heart to seek the face of God and here, go to New York City and talk to those boys, picture of seven boys indicted for murder. Go there. I believe all true ministry comes out of intimacy with God. I, ha- I believe that the Holy Ghost is always stirring. God is always moving by his spirit. And he... he he will take uneducated, he will take those that have, have never known the flow of the Holy Spirit. And he, will, he can bring to you something so far beyond what you, what you have ever conceived in your mind, how God can use you. I, I went to New York City weighing 117 pounds uneducated, Uh, but there was something that came out of that intimacy with the Lord, and that was the spirit of faith. It came by just reading that word. I wasn't trying to pray for faith. Faith comes. You just read it. It'll come. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to read a book. It'll come. The Lord stirred my heart again about 23 years ago. I was on the streets of New York preaching again. And I, I saw the sin and degradation of 42nd Street, Times Square, Broadway and 42nd Street. And the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart, you get back to prayer and seeking his face as you did in the beginning. And I set that quality time. And I began to seek his face and weep before the Lord. <clears throat> and I came back to, to, to New York City, I think it was about a year later, in the same burden. And the Lord said, I want you to raise up a church. And it needs to be on Broadway. It needs to be visible because I want to use it for the last days. It, and God answered prayer. He gave us one of the the most beautiful theaters in the United States. And God said clearly to me that He would open the altars if we would we if we would have faith and believe that every time we stood in that pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the altars would there there would always be people at that altar, and. Pastor Carter can bear witness to that, that we have what I call the open altars. 
and we we've seen that fruit but i don't think looking back i don't think a church would be here and touching the world if i disobeyed that word from the holy spirit that comes in it's it, it, Antioch, it says, Paul and Barnabas went out sent by the Holy Ghost. And I know that the Holy Ghost sent me there. And I know that it came through intimacy with the Lord. The word of the Lord came. And I'm talking, and I'm not going to talk much longer, but I'm talking like a father. And I hear the Holy Spirit speaking and urging me and just like a father talking to a son or a daughter. We've got to get back to seeking the face of God. I see young people, even pastors, uh, Twitter, Twittering, is it? I, I see all of this technology. And I, I see women, men and young people especially, both thumbs going. And I'm, I'm serious about this. You're spending more time with your technology than you are with the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking from the throne now. Probably one of the most dangerous things that's ever happened to this generation. There's a lot of good coming out of it. But I, I see and all all this new technology, and I, I see Christians, or hear about Christians, lined up for hours waiting to get the latest toy. It is taking you, taking you away from the prayer closet, taking you away from fixing your mind on eternal things. You say, well, I spent my hour in prayer this morning. I read my Bible. I, I have all this time. No, I, I'm telling you, I'm pleading you with, with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul said his preaching was obnoxious to some people. Maybe you've never been in a meeting where an elderly man just sits in the pulpit and just talks, his, talks out of his heart. But I, I know that that spirit of discouragement that's come upon some of you is going to get worse until it drives you into a pit of despair. Until you, even if you have to have a, have a technology fast. I, I'm telling you, there's some of you so hooked on your technology, your Facebook or whatever book it is, and spending so much time preoccupied where you don't have a free mind you, you 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 have all of these things moving in your mind and all of these uh, messages to catch up on and all of these things that are, are are bouncing through your mind like tennis balls let's speak it in the mind of the Holy Ghost and if if nothing else comes out of this meeting it's a call from you from the Holy Spirit through me right now. Take this before the Holy Ghost and think about it. You have time for that, but you don't have time for prayer. And this, this keeps ringing in my heart from, from the prophet, Brother Ravenhill, preaches, don't pray. That's not an accusation. That was from a man who knew, knew 
the Father in prayer like few other men I ever have met. Get back to fasting. Pastor Carter calls for three day fast three or four times a year, and one's about to come up. And if 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 you want to know the secret of what God is doing there, it's this is prayer and fasting. If you go to Brooklyn Tabernacle, it's prayer. Three thousand people to prayer meeting and the fasting and being sent, drawing as drawing as a narrow circle and seeking God within that circle. Jesus drew a small circle around what he was called to do from his father. He had someone come up and say, well, I'm having trouble with my brother on an inheritance. Can you pray for me? Can you give me advice? And Jesus said, no, that's not my calling. And many of you have such a wide circle you can't even find time to pray. If you have to narrow your circle and start saying no to some of the demands around you, especially if you, if you uh, are multitasking all the time and draw a narrow circle. I have drawn, in my lifetime, I've drawn a narrow circle and I stay within that circle. And I've learned to say no to anything that would rob me of my time with the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm not where I should be right now as far as seeking the face of the Lord. Physical problems and, and family uh, problems of health. And, and yet, I feel that urgent call again because something is coming so soon. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken just as the Lord has, has promised. Pastor Carter uh, spoke about that yesterday. But everything that I've been prophesying over the 30 years, it's at the door. We're, we're, we're facing now the final, final word from the Lord, prepare to meet your God. Lord, I pray that in this moment of this service, Holy Ghost, I'm asking you to take over. I preach weekly and frail. But I know that you have sent me here. I had no plans to come, and you told me clearly to come. I had no intention to speak, but you put it on my heart. And I'm asking you now, Holy Spirit, to take these weak words, maybe disjointed at times. And Holy Spirit, you call us. I can't make people pray. Lord, and I need this now. I, I I need this. We can go to conferences and we can get concepts and and we can be stirred, but Lord, there has to be a commitment made right now for everyone in this building is discouraged. I'll not ask for a show of hands, but you know everyone that's here in the battle they go through. And there's not one person here that doesn't have some area in their life of discouragement, some place where God doesn't seem to be answering prayer. Maybe it's for their children and and there's this inner cry, but oh God, don't let us just take it by faith. Bring us back to our faces before you. Lord, will you break my heart again? Will you bring more tenderness and brokenness before you so that when we stand before people, we stand with broken hearts and broken spirits because you said you're, you live in a high and holy place and with the man that humbles himself and walks contritely before you. Lord, give us contrite hearts. Help us, O oh Lord Jesus, never to get away, never to get too busy. And Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted. Lord, you're calling us back to the secret closet. You're calling us back to really seeking your face. And, 
You're calling some to stay all night, all night long, and back to fasting and, and giving you no rest and ministering to you, oh God. And I, I pray now that as we close out this conference and we think of the name of the conference and what was called, and Lord Jesus, that can't happen. Everything that was advertised, inviting people to come here, saying you can leave changed. And Lord, change us. Let no one escape right now. Not one person escape the convicting arrow of the Holy Spirit. And may that arrow just open up our heart until we bleed as you bled for the lost. Oh, God. It's, it's us. It's, we can't look for someone else. We can't look for some, uh, something that br brings us just uh, how to choose, tr how to do this, how to do that. But, oh, God, come upon me right now. Come upon this audience. Holy Spirit, manifest yourself and convict us with great, great love and compassion. I hear your call, Lord, and the call is to Times Square Church, to Brooklyn Tabernacle, and to every church that calls itself Pentecost, and church that calls itself by the name of the Lord. God, bring a revival of prayer and seeking your face. Lord, it's simple. It's always been that. We can add all the theology, but it's, it's always come back to this stay in the word of God. Feed your heart until this, this becomes the very lifeblood do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how to close this meeting, it's, and that's not my job. Is somebody behind me here? Would you stand? I think we're just supposed to be quiet before the Lord here and just let him speak to us. Um, To seek his face here. 
let's not just hear a word today. Let's let's just even now practice it, just to spend spend a moment in His presence without being rushed. The phones are off. The Twitters are gone. The Facebook that's powerful. We need to hear that. This generation and those younger than me need to hear that because we'll get so consumed. So Father, we just wait on you. No music. No. Let's not have any more words or interpretations. This is just this is quiet before the Lord. Okay. Bless you, Jesus. We're going to open the altars one last time. You can kneel where you are. You can stand. You can walk up and down the side aisles. You can find a place in the lobby out in the grounds around side the convention center here. But let's spend the next few moments. Should we just, uh, there's not going to be a formal uh, au revoir, a goodbye to you. It's going to be just, we're going to go out these doors to seek in his face. Uh, Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that uh, we could we could thank you, God, without necessarily having a closing celebration. It's always good to go out on a high note. I know that, God. There's, there's, there's plans of man that we, we learn through the conferences. But, Lord, we're just going to disregard that now because we want your face more than we want anything else. We want your, we want your heart more than we want anything else, God. And so we, we'll, we'll break the norms and we'll go into a different trend and say, God, without the music playing, Lord, without a, 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 a big farewell bash, without uh, thanking everyone for coming, we'll just say, Jesus, we're here, we're here for you. We're here with you. Set us apart, God. Set us apart to be men and women of God who, who far beyond anything else, desire to seek your face. Oh, God, let us be a Jacob generation. That Psalms 24, this is the generation of those who seek your face. And then you said you'd open up the gates wide and people would enter in. So, Father, let us be that Jacob generation to seek your face. We close this meeting now, God, just in, in, in nothing else but waiting on you, God. I know many have to go. Some have to catch airplanes and drive to locations. Lord, we bless them in Jesus' name. We ask them to go in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. But we thank you. In closing, we have this time. Just uh, We've heard a word from uh, uh, an elder statesman, a prophet of God, and he has called us to shut some things aside. And, Lord, we, just, we, we give the first fruits of that right now, even in this auditorium, and say, God, we're going to do that in Jesus' name. Feel free to come to the front, the altar. Otherwise, God's blessing on you, grace and peace. Pray to seek the face of God. He said, David, there's only 24 hours in a day. That's all Elijah had, and he prayed. You can pray like Elijah, and you can, he said, God always makes a way for a praying man. I was taught to pray in, in teenage years. I remember praying and being so touched by the hand of God. I would, I would lay before, prostrated before the Lord, and I would try to get up, and a hand would just... I couldn't see it, but it would just place me back down. And that feeling was so exhilarating. It's so incredible to have the hand of God just lay you back down. And you start laughing and crying. It's so, it's so incredible, the touch. And I've known the touch of God. I was called when I was eight years old into the ministry. Now, please don't think this is an old man just rambling. God allowed me to come to this place at this time to share my heart. I, I, I got tired, I got weary of being a Pentecostal church and not seeing anything happen. 
preaching to the same people, four songs, testimony meeting, a sermon, altar call, and never see anybody at the altar. And I came to the conclusion that if this is Christian workers, whoever you may be here now, and I have on many occasions young pastors say, could, could I have 15 minutes with you if just, just to find out how God used you? And uh, they've read the book or seen the movie or <clears throat> heard a message and touched them. And, of course, couldn't do it. It's impossible. But I'd like to take that 15 minutes with you right now. I'm 79 years old, been preaching for 58 years, and I've seen a lot of things, endured a lot of things. But I, I just want to speak to you. I have no notes. I have no uh, prepared sermon. But I have a heart, I think, that's ready to share a few things with you that when you leave here, you find out that you're not just talking about the church. We're talking about you and your heart. Uh, Yest yesterday, when they were praying, we were praying for one another. A young pastor and his wife asked for prayer, and uh, I said, "Could you sum up in one word what you're going through?" And they said, "Discouragement." They weren't depressed, but they were discouraged. I want to talk to you about what happened to me when I got my heart so stirred. I, now, I've already prayed for, for blessing on this, so don't think I haven't prayed about the message. I want to get right into what I feel the Lord to have me share with you. I pastored a little church in Pennsylvania, a town of about a thousand people. I pastored a little church of about a hundred people. They were good people, they were farmers, they were miners. And I loved them and I pastored there for five years. But on the fifth year especially, and it had been growing on me for quite a while, I, I, I would see the same faces, no one was being saved. And I had, we had a nice little cottage next to the church and enough to live on and I, I did what most of us do. I had my devotional time, and I read my Bible, especially to get sermons, and occasionally would just read for the sake of trying to get closer to the Lord's heart. I'm not an educated man. I had one year of Bible school. But my father, I, can't, I came from a line of pastors, uh, preachers. I think I'm the eighth generation all the way back to the Civil War, where one of my great-grandparents died in the Civil War and came from alignment preachers, and my father taught me to Pentecost. I don't want it. All these years just in, in, in four walls and not seeing anybody. Of course, we weren't going out to see anybody. We, weren't, we were not out in those restaurants and other places. But I began to seek the face of God. And when you begin to f uh, seek the face of God, the devil will bring a conspiracy of interruptions. And I'm telling this now. If you set your heart to seek God, if you s set your heart to seek him, the devil's going to put on you a conspiracy of interruptions. You'll receive calls like you've never received before. He would do everything to keep you from the prayer closet. <laughs> but I'm here. T I'm here this evening. Would you would you pray with me right now, Heavenly Father? You've given me a word. I, I tell you, somebody just bring me a chair Up from the side there, please. I've been going through a physical. Just right here, please. Second. 
That's fine. I told Pastor Carter once, Okay, son. I love you, Dave. Thank you. Be seated, please. Well, one thing we have to say before we say anything else is that God is here. I said God has been here, and he's here at this moment also. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that blonde lady sitting here in the front seat. Honey, there are a lot of new people, some in the balcony. Just stand up and wave at the people so they can remember you in prayer. I'm a little nervous. I haven't preached in months. <laughs> but we know the Holy Spirit is here. I want to talk to young pastors and young 